Good morning. Thank you. You know, I used to work in drug abuse. People hold hands, sing kumbaya, you know, and you say good morning. They go, ah, good morning. I actually became addicted to it. Um, so I'm delighted to be here, and I'm really thrilled that there are so many people here and watching online because this is an issue that many of us have been worrying about for many years, and the large numbers of people interested really speak to an increasing understanding of the necessity to communicate science with the public, because without the public, why would we do it? Our job is the betterment of humankind. And if the public isn't a ready receptor for the outcomes of our work in the scientific community, why are we doing it? Why are they supporting it? So. Okay, so we're going to talk about communicating science to the public effectively, and I warn you, I'm going to violate two things we learned in our study. One is never speak too fast, never use too many slides. I'm going to do both of them. <laughs> All right, here we go. So what's the problem? As uh, has been well articulated, uh, the need has never been greater, but doing it, is hard. A, it's hard, and B, it's an acquired skill. It's not an innate skill. So I had the honor and the pleasure to chair this academy report called Communicating Science Effectively, whose main goal was actually to lay out a research agenda for the science of science communication. But in the process, we looked at what do we know about what works. What do we know about what works based on the science that had been done? And then what additional research might make it more effective? Both of those issues are, of course, critically important. In the first case, I will tell you that a lot of research has been done. People hear it. They say, great, and then they do what they want. Um, but don't let me stop them. It was a fabulous committee, many of whom are in the room. I do want to particularly acknowledge Dietram Scheufele, who was the vice chair of the committee and um, was actually indispensable, but many others are here as well. Staff was fabulous, and let me just acknowledge them as well. Melissa Weltros was the study director, and her team did a fabulous job. Now, I was worrying about any report and talking about it, and how could you summarize it in a short period of time? So I'm going to very quickly highlight the cross-cutting themes we came up with. So the first one was to align the strategy with your goals. Sounds like a truism. Actually, most of this sounds like a truism, but it's only a truism if people actually do it, and I can tell you they don't. So that is, don't don't do what, what you want to say, do what you want to get done. And you can read the goals and I won't go through them. But the strategies are different to accomplish each of them. Another one, know before whom you stand. That is, tailor your message, tailor your approach to the particular audience. This actually is the biggest mistake that I see people make. They talk about what they want to talk about, not what people want to hear. Uh, the information is complex, people have a terrible time with uncertainty, and uh, we in science come to take uncertainty as a fact of life at some point, but the general public sort of says, well, if you're not really sure what you're talking about, then maybe I can do whatever I want, and that's just okay. Anyway, you get the point. Science is hard. Uh, this is actually probably the most important finding, uh, and that is that the deficit model, that is to say that the problem is that people just don't get it, that model is wrong. It's not totally wrong because, of course, people have to have a minimal level of understanding to engage in the conversation at all. But having said that, by and large, if communication were only done better, people would not necessarily agree with what we want them to say, and we can talk more about that later. People rarely make decisions based only on science, and again, that needs to be taken into account. P 
People draw on their own beliefs about the world. They use their own analogies, metaphors, and prior experiences. And a corollary of that, of course, is then how you frame the issue is critically important. You don't get to just say it your way. You have to do it in a, a way that will work with the audience, et cetera. So this is the only word you'll take from my talk. It is not a speech impediment. Uh, the word glocal sends the message that says people fundamentally only care about things that affect them locally or personally. So you have to be able to take a global issue and make it meaningful at the local or the personal level. One of the most important principles of communicating anything effectively. And this one I stuck in, it isn't actually in the report, but it's one of my favorite sayings. Only scientists are stuck with what science says. If I violate scientific evidence, I will be struck by lightning. <laughs> and nobody will ever listen to me and I'll have no credibility. But the rest of the public, including some unnamed policymakers we may know uh, for a long time, have been free to disregard, deny, distort scientific evidence, and they don't get struck by lightning. And therefore, we have to find a way to uh, respond to that. But that's another principle I've learned in life. This is another truism. The media environment is incredibly complex. We have to find ways to work through it. It's fragmented, fast-paced. You can read as well as I can. And with the advent of social media, there are virtually no gatekeepers. How do we get our messages to go through that complex and competitive environment? So engaging with the public works far better than talking at the public. There's a whole movement that actually started in Europe but, uh, and is much more active there than here. It's rather than public communication. It's what we call public engagement. It's to actually have a dialogue with the public. And it's a big change. Instead of communicating at the public, we need to communicate with the public, move from a monologue to a dialogue. It's very difficult for scientists. First of all, they're not prepared. I have a fond saying, most scientists should not be allowed out in public. Um, many, most scientists are not prepared to talk about their work, and listening is really hard. You know, scientists like to tell people stuff, and therefore they're not really listening frequently to the perspective of the audience, and engagement is an acquired skill, as is communication more broadly. I'm going to end by just highlighting some of the research questions that we posed, and I apologize to my colleagues on the committee that I only picked a few out. Um, the complexities, we need to better understand the importance of individual and social factors for different audiences. They don't generalize nearly as well as we would like. And again, we don't get to pick what works, right? So we need to have a far better understanding of individual characteristics and how they and the various environmental factors interact to determine what works. We know that talking at people doesn't work nearly as well as literally engaging with the public, and a reasonable question is, uh, so what does work in that? That is to say, what are the optimal ways to engage with the public? I will tell you that um, when I was at NIH, I had all these town meetings around the country, and you know, it was about drugs, people come, and um, they didn't do a darn thing. I loved it. I got to talk to big crowds <laughs> and tell them about the science of drug abuse and addiction. And it had virtually no impact. Why? The people who showed up were the people who had one extreme point of view or another extreme point of view. All they wanted to do was yell at each other, um, or me. And so 
Anyway, we need to have a far better understanding of what the right processes are. Policymakers, we all worry about using science to influence policy or how policy should be used in science. So what actually works? We understand that policy is made on the basis of facts and values, never on the basis of facts alone. So how do we get our facts to play a more prominent role in policy development than we can? And how can science communication affect it? And an important one is, does it matter who's doing the communicating? Um, yeah, conflicts over beliefs and values is actually one of my pet things since it's really tough. When you get into issues where people either have a lot of personal experience or strong <clears throat> feelings, trying to overlay science on their life decisions is extremely difficult. And then, of course, I mentioned the media environment and how difficult it is to know exactly what you need to do. And I keep using the word exactly because that's, of course, what science is about. And so in a science of science communication, it's important to move from generalizations to boring specifics. Get down to the details of, you know, what's the best strategy for actually doing it. And then we have an array of uh, recommendations about how to strengthen the research enterprise. And I'm watching the clock. I'm done with that one. Uh, and let me uh, end with a, uh, a request. So as the science progresses, let's talk to our colleagues about it. And let's see if we can't actually have science replace intuition and common sense about what works in science communication. Thank you.